Hello. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the readings in contemporary poetry. My name is Jasmine Raymond. I work at the, um, the curator here. And it's my pleasure to introduce to tonight um, Vincent Catt. He's the curator of the readings since it, we reinstated the readings in 2011. Now it's been a couple of years. Um, we're delighted that Vincent accepted the invitation to work with us and to bring back this important series to the city and to Dia. The series presents writers, poets of different generations to create parallels between their voices and their work. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome tonight's, this evening, poets, Geoffrey Young and Yak Kimbo. Thank you both for your generous acceptance to, the, to be part of this series. I also would like to extend uh, a warm thanks to Tom Raworth, who had planned to be part of the evening as well, but could not make it um, from, to, due to personal health reasons, could not travel to New York. But we are very grateful um, that tonight we're here together and that um, we'll be listening to Geoffrey Jong and Jack Kimball. I would like to thank as well um, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs who will give us support again in, in, throughout the entire series since we reinstated and they're very um, great to us, not only to the poetry reading but also to our Artists on Artists lecture series. And I have to give a special nod to Brooklyn Brewery, who gives us the beer that you have, and um, they keep us refreshed. And um, following, I just want to explain the structure in case you haven't been here in a while. We will have the first reader, and then we'll have a short intermission, and you can go to the restroom, take another beer, and come back, and we'll introduce the second speaker, okay? It's now my pleasure to introduce Vincent, and um, have him introduce the poets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmeel, and thank you all for coming out tonight. This is gonna drift on me. Um, yes, and there are also books for sale by both of tonight's poets, so please take a look at those as well. And um, so, yeah, uh, Jack Kimball will read first, followed by Jeffrey Young after the intermission. Jack Kimball was born in 1954 in Boston. He is an after language poet, his term, an editor of Faux Press, Cambridge, which he founded in 2001. He's taught at Harvard University, MIT, and in Japan. His books of poetry include Post Twyla from Blue Lion Books in 2006 and Post Twyla Reset from Faux Other in 2010, Manship from Detour in 2001, and Frosted from Poets and Poets Press 2001. He lives outside Boston. Jack Kimball's writing is some of the hardest for me to parse, which is why I've stopped trying to and just sit back now and enjoy it. For enjoy it I do, that much is certain. I know of his degrees in linguistics, so I can try to read it from those angles, language as a social construct, perhaps. That is a big perhaps, though, as Kimball, the poet, is always jumping from place to place. I feel in a way as though his critical reviews and blog posts available at pantaloons.blogspot.com are also forms of his poetry. Here, for example, is part of a recent post, quote, the tank smoke is elevated, parens are helpful. I'm back with my typos, a hiatus to find my mind breathing. So much so this looks stupid, start over. Whom will you discover, end of quote. He just lets loose like that, and his poems are similar, though probably less loose. Some have a found quality, while others seem to be randomly tapping into various zeitgeists. There is sometimes a queer element that might or might not be found, as in Lacing My Skates, which begins, quote, 
When I turned around and saw him, that was it. I knew as soon as I looked, that is the man I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with. Burgundy cashmere v-neck, silver watch by dot, 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 end of quote. This reminds me of no one as much as Joe Lesur. It is beyond conversational, beyond poetry of the daily, which is what makes it so intriguing. The facing poem in Kimball's 2008 chapbook, Pathologies, entitled Shit, takes a completely different tack to contemporary life. Quote, don't stab me raw. You put stuff out there, it comes back, God bless. My shit is real, you can see through snow pants, the runny kind, it's a joke, end of quote. So it's about setting up a rhythm, I hear that. Perhaps we can find an answer as to where Kimball is intent on guiding poetry in this sentence from his prose text, Crab's Nebulae, quote, poetry requires a few portable desks with secret drawers packed with repressed impurities as well as crystal goblets and tools for investment, promissory notes on friendship to burn directly from the can, and falconry, along with newer initiatives." End of quote. What those newer initiatives may be, I leave it to Jack Kimball to present or not, as he chooses. I, however, with certainty, present to you the stimulating, enigmatic Jack Kimball. Some of this will be familiar to you, Vincent, since uh, Pantaloons is sort of poetry. Uh, and so the, these have been ripped out of Pantaloons, uh, some of them at least. And I st uh, most, if not all of these are untitled. Every man is a Rambo issue. Be mine, as we consider relaxed words, northern flickers with masked ducks, or a painter at noon, someone who routinely does things that would be awesome if intentional. Purple, black, and teal are exaggerated. The murders were in control in, ruined by the sounding it out tools. Very good. Very goo. I mean knocking the repenters off, throwing knives, wrecking them from the inside, slicing up. A game of gloves is long overdue. And I'm back in the duck shoot now, reading and writing without an attorney. That's how the paint sails. I read the body is loaded with symbolism for all seasons, veiled by a puff of condensation in the air atop rain-like stilts. My mind messed up. Sun pours down, unobstructed in the region. <clears throat> Prepare your red matter. I'm leaving disjunction behind to work with you, our plan, is one way to avoid subjectivity as a nominal fallacy. To be anyone who will die isn't perverse. It's the inside dress code. Ah, holism doesn't come naturally. Nicholas Christakis. Yet the parts know how to grow, Benjamin Aranda. A cretinous bunny stuffed in an envelope is ludicrous. It's untidy and young. I basically authorize it. While your back and forth is rubbed into my hair, no hair, in all these dubious directions you're going in until you do an onslaught. That's the game in self-presence. Yourself, perhaps, to squelch actions that seem certain when hidden by how far you are beaten into their projections. We are of navy birth, 
feeling not so bad about the brief gleam that seethed with rank. A gazing furl, trying to gnarl sparkle to figure our life together. Our history, okay, sunsets, standing in the waves like Jennifer Moxley's Ark of Grace, a mystical exit from the trap of birth, chance, and bloodlines. Call it talent, or perhaps obedience. Mostly we are poor. Uh, this woman <clears throat> has a dog and dyes her hair red. We leveraged the social graph to miss you. How long have you planted thoughts without a gender balance? I agree. To be reviewed is to be published. Shit. <laughs> Teaching can't be taught. Let me pull an invisible to the eye hair off your blouse to increase the speed. When you write, you find your living partner. She's a social creature, capable of more complex communication, traveling in large groups or schools. Well, two out of three. I hardly know you and will never know you. I'll give you a call. Okay, so I, I need to get some water really fast. Sorry for the interruption. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yes. This is interesting. First line here is <clears throat> I've been on a fresh water binge. This is while I'm doing only one thing at one time on a crazed errand stream to a structuralist's degree. I won't cry when it becomes anything without a message. I'll trade you as my hands are scared of leaving you among the spoils. It's looking like this is the rag century. And the worst part is we made messes all over to suit the last one where we were getting lost, and then I can test the following. Gogol, I'm really pronounce it, Gogol, Nicolai Gogol, with an MA in these matters, says gut feeling, sane behavior, and non-criminal discourse teeter on the grotesque. I can't turn that down. I can't mean just what his language means. There's a trade-off my trade. In the din, nihilism shuts the door 24-7 on indisputable birdsong. It's a good thing. The door from nihilism leads to the rescue of children and all it contains. All I could have told you. Uh, targeting methods, sort of a title, I guess. To appear transparent out of a board game. After a button is pushed, a model young theorist says, hello, how are you? Then reverses course. She heads upstairs to an installation in perfect solitude. I've heard that scream. No, she didn't. She's indelibly here. She didn't help, but she did. What did they spell for lunch? Slender objective on a square obstacle. To follow instructions, slippers are warmed. The commissary is down in the subchambers, aimlessly glistening. I'm often holed up on the second level with the major issues that I have still, meaning my whole life. A kimono has been entered explaining sex without thinking and with. A fragrance is found shaking our heads, wiping our brows. 
The same stairs float for good if they could. Like all people going in and out of buildings, climbing steps, you're 100% normal running up debt to keep devotees heartbroken, to downplay scene after scene, only springing or twisting into new, new life and renewed commitment at the last possible moment. On second thought, call me fracking or stinky. I touched it and it sprayed me. The herd rushed to the rescue. There's a deadline. A tumble of inventions, an ambush, a weakening of the night today. Body in the night. <clears throat> One enzyme waking up isolated, seeming eternity. This is Ida's heroic bitch. A few thought chunks coasting someplace that make the senses look futuristic in the right light that's constant. The point ahead is to enable the passing tourney among tense foo dudes to nuance the three-in-one innocence to proceed. There's a little automated palletizer of bread with industrial KUKA robots in a bakery in Germany where groove is still a verb. The odd relay repeated. I did my research. We don't do pinpricks, I'm told. I'm not adding bespoke grammar to discontinuous anguish. That would be another gardening purchase, like you da pothole, puck-aged shadows, not today. Lastly, I'm worshiping a Shrek glass while the full loom of grasses blows, down, uh, blows town, including the swerve parts, since this is like the rest that could potentially be used again until such a time when it gets replaced. That I think of you. Anyway, I retract my falsehoods, and for the same sutra, I condemn and mourn meritocracy. For and all men are servants that nonetheless practice geometry to, ins to inspect the brain. I don't think it's called trample land for nothing. It's nice, finally, to put a face to the humiliating nickname. Okay. Moving into a slightly less jaundiced view. There is a nothing. Yet nothing is forbidden. Or a bust of daft tone substitutes for info. I lower your voice <clears throat> to approximate the closest parody somewhere. What's a sociopath? The truth is manifold vacuum, and we're feathery. Shorthand abstractions like these comprise unforgettable elements to our touching and holding the moment, surrounding it with illusions of taking off for totems unknown, spinning or spun upset, out of control. And that's how we fasten the starry messenger to move around objects. 100% our touch. I'm a failure sometimes. Freedom is personal. A big glob crashing the night after the supermoon. Diodes in crimson a soft spot for its success, the beach magnified, ironically revived. <clears throat> I've highlighted a new scent reaching through, sandy from somewhere, and Apollonian aromas of clear polycarbonate. Who owns the interior under socialism? You sit on that side of the room. You're locked tight. You like to dwell on differences, on crispnesses and whispers in the air. 
Your sleep is like a process language. Mercury is languidly pens passive, and pensive is what I meant to say. Mercury is languidly pensive. It, it's coming back, back. No, no to temples of glyph glyphic turmoil, ground into torpid incision. No to prophase. No contusion of the supremacist spheres. You're saying no to virulent callow stances and covers in grim ball bearings. Cut the bloodied mesh, no kitsch in nature, please, no chiastic haunts, no ilk of valid colloids, no mimic measure, no ceremony, plinthing a drumbeat. Also, no discalcula, no hindsight bias, no flavor. Filming you again, filming, double quotes, versus painting just your voice, the glass house perforated by action tones beating hulk, hulks up that pour the next vodka that makes us cry. A film with multiple data fields with a crew of stunning extras in malaise, one supported by a partner grabbing the ring of two men on remote in paint. I'm told you'd prefer not to watch them, better to ask a friend or two to paint you, pretending they are you, falling mute covering your lips with my vote. Sonnet to the people at Boeing. Since the poor make us sick, stuck instead learning the plain facts by heart in capsule surveys. The pace is non-committal, not nothing. If you don't inhabit what you're saying, <sighs> yes, fool, you sick intern, bobbling, learning about how to learn are cool and fatuous, even if officialdom won't count when we begin to step away. We have to trust you on these matters, one apiece. We'll provide all the jargon on screen. And when you come to a three syllable you don't recognize, you can just look down and see it's one syllable disentanglement. I'm no model, I just look like one. Helen Vendler. <laughs> As we advance, there are 4,000 voice to gifts with references from which to plagiarize a response. While the materials become more complex, building on what's been said, yielding faster access to the obscure but brightest table with soft freaks, handsome, sniffed all over, never complicated, staring down our bite wing. Ask your financial professional. So, um, coming close to the end here. This is called imperialism. The happiness of one bright red chair with a table in one corner washes up in our DNA. Small islands serve as hideouts. You'll need a new camping saw and hood scoop. And I'll invade your space and just leave. I am inoffensive and most of the time my headlamp is on. But you know, what if it's good we met? How does it resume? I overheard it's remarkably ambitious off the boards, like when water lilies kick off their work boots and women rule. Snipers crouch. The idea of Burberries. And the last emperor had sex with multiple staffers. We have one of the most advanced distribution systems. Our agents are crazy for the bigger paradigm of what's to come. An aperture opens up and a lovable perspective is achieved. You disappear and you have children and they disappear. Uh, for Pete Rose. Never enough rest or workout 
Propose a synonym. Gardenias. Constraint-driven gigantism. Lotos are doing so better. They were dangerous once. Your voice is transparent. Your voice is transparent, too late to make it sparse. Even your restraint is in your eyes, doubling in a maze of sex pits. You're too qualified and thrifty to feel anything. Your displeasure is back to normal, as if furniture never happened, forgetting you enjoy a revisionist view, unobstructed, puckered in ab exercise. Okay, two, uh, two more. You're both batshit over the Audi. Well, I really enjoyed it. 95% compact. For this is how badinage rifles through consequences and fronds drop their tendrils, unstopping sense. Four wheels, one approach, a moonroof, lounging in queue for the motorcade. You can't predict what you are going to do. And there aren't enough shortcuts to go around to encapsulate your suspicions. What does he look like now? It's OK to ask. Snaps of skepticism, sharpened anomalies. An etude-like celebrity. Ancestors understood by these scarves we house sit, patched in resistance, creating busy, making chaos work enacting a more cautionary life, absent trifles, and your intuitive psychiatry. The music took off about here. First looked wonderful along the quays, with embarrassed breakpoints to the past, thinning out in the high style of ending. Auto dicks. Something hesitant but better starts the red engine to recover what takes priority mid-grand. My job is moving the marsh until it gets exaggerated. Let's conquer death with abundance. Evasion foreground style and motives. Abruptly, per the chronicles of free retribution rhymes with the earnest ladytron inside emotion. Reading Delmore Schwartz repeatedly gives me head. We, or most of us, have an attorney after all, but this looks stupid to vocalize what's sunk in. I can't worry or pierce my ears further. Untitled, last poem. The sexes are divided, so is capital. All I can wish for is 86 floors of hot belief I'm a wielder of cynicism, goaded identity, the whole thing just snowballed. Huge finesse augurs repression and destruction in one immaculate fictive symbol. Jonathan stayed and worked with the new ones coming in, who are all, could you be a little more specific, doctor, while they rested on the beach after a session of folded wing snap rolls. Time to release the affinity shapes, but I'll stop now. If you or I decry how ambivalent I am, I miss the point generally. On the other hand, I kind of get overstimulated by bland assertions, as I wouldn't know how to come down on these vital issues. Do you like spiral staircases? There is nothing like an emergent zone of autonomy to find a prosthetic artifact like lack of despair. A few facts comprise a marketplace where figures are garbled when least derivative, ephemeral, objective content triumphs. It's kind of a snob racket. Charles Bukowski. A battle swarm steps over and above casual monotones. Everyone's direction is shifted our nervous system distorts changes in love over time. And worth repeating, we weren't orphaned. We just decided to pursue other interests. To get reelected to you, 
as will prolifer proliferate to hear if you try, if you have the confidence we wiretap the secret you weigh. You get no credit for this. No ripped off melancholy, no special tiny swaggering to cash in, but here's a substitution agreement containing you and me. It's taken this long to read the gospel of wealth. Oh, to be bubble-footed in dark griefs or preferring total lunacy to kissing, moaning about diffusion at any cost, at any cost to render your mouth a mess of slop. This is for you now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I would like to um, echo Jasmine's words from earlier and to thank both Jack and Jeffrey for being here tonight. I'd also like to mentioned that you can look on the DIA website to find the upcoming readings. And the next one is October 21st. It's Patrizia Cavalli and Rosanna Warren, which is a, a very special reading. There's a, a, book, a book of um, Cavalli's poetry. It's the first book published in English, translations of her poems from Italian. And um, Rosanna Warren is one of the um, contributors to that book, so it's a great combination to hear both of them. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Jeffrey Young. Jeffrey Young was born in Los Angeles in 1944 and grew up in San Diego. He moved to Great Barrington, Massachusetts in 1982 after living in California, New Mexico, and France. His small press, The Figures, 1975 to 2005, has published more than 135 books of poetry, art writing, and fiction. Young's own recent books include All the Anarchy I Want, Dumbstruck, Get on Your Pony and Ride, and The Riot Act, He's also the author of previous works, including Fickle Sonnets, Lights Out, and Cerulean Embankments. He's directed the Jeffrey Young Gallery for the last 22 years and written catalog essays for numerous artists. As co-conspirator of the language poets, it is no surprise that some of Jeffrey Young's work is language inflected. Some of it, such as the rules-based 1,000-word opus Mount Trove Curry to an experimental extreme. What might not be predictable, perhaps, is that Young is also one of our most accessible and funny poets. The sexuality in Young's poems is that of a straight male, but it reminds me of the way sexuality functions in Frank O'Hara's poems, creating a buoyancy that propels the poem forward on the feet of Young's precise words and rhythms. Buoyancy is much harder to maintain than it appears. In fact, it is close to impossible. It is relatively easy to hit on a rhythm that seems to give the poem a lift, but more often than not, the following effect is one of an inevitable letdown. Ebullience, from the Latin to boil, bubble, and the following related terms all apply to Young's poetry. Jauntiness, elation, euphoria, animation, vivacity, bounciness, or as we might say today, bounce. Young is sometimes a formalist, at least one bent on stretching form as far as humanly possible, as in his book Fickle Sonnets. He is adept at playing the hopeless romantic, as in his sonnet Nowhere Man, about a young woman named Valentina he encounters in Rome. Young is a deft practitioner of the poem addressed to an artist, whether someone he knows personally or not, and of the poem as an account, as in his, as in his hilariously lifelike Rene Ricard night at Bill Berkson's Frank O'Hara talk at Poets House on Spring Street, 
which concludes, then the reception ended, Renee and Raymond dissolved into the night, and I remember wondering if on their way down, Renee would have asked Raymond who that guy was he was talking to, or if by the time they hit the street, it would even matter. Young is a master of restraint, which enables him to write deeply affecting poems of breakup, memory, and elegy. In Elegy LY3, one learns the poem is an elegy for the poet's father by piecing together information rather than being told directly. What makes this poem so interesting is that Young never leaves his ground as a modern poet. Perhaps Young's greatest elegy is not to a person at all, but to a city, Rome. Young writes, quote, Dear reader, I am sorry. You go in my place. Let me wave goodbye and swear never to mention Rome again, end of quote. But he will, we are sure, as he will continue to mention, or at least configure, the many passions that fire him. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Young. That was a beautiful introduction. Thanks. And it's great to be a Dia. You've been thanking us for coming here, but I think Jack and I want to thank Dia for inviting us. And uh, since Tom Rayworth, who was supposed to be here, couldn't be here, I thought I'd read one little bit from Tom, just uh, not in his uh, London accent, um, but just a few words from Tom, uh, who would you know, certainly give a great reading if he were here. Ordinary people, I have killed poetry. Yes, and I had to tell you, books are dead. Refer others to your own experience. Perhaps identical thoughts flicker through each head at the same time. Intelligence was the invader from space and won. Defend your planet. Now that sounds intelligent. That's Tom. Um, I was hoping to have this book ready here uh, called The Point Less Taken. And um, the title may be the best thing about it, um, but I, you know, I was writing a million sonnets and I was thinking of quatrain, 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 couplet, and I got so used to that as a way to proceed through a poem that I decided finally to start writing some prose. And then the paragraph became very sexy, like, when does a paragraph end, and when can you do indent? And I, so it, you, you get into these little things when you're a fetishist. And <clears throat> so this is the opening uh, short prose, all the little short prose pieces, um, n nothing longer than a short page. And the book's going to have lovely drawings by Lucas Reiner, who's a L.A. painter. Short one Pablo. Sorry about the bouncer. Short one Pablo. What is your customary practice? What skills do your mentors, your peers, your friends possess? Do you really wear a life belt in the studio, or can you risk it all with impunity? If this were Paris a hundred years ago, semicolon, if I answered to the name Guillaume Apollinaire, copain de Picasso, semicolon, and if this sentence were a conference delivered to left bank expats, no doubt I'd be defending cubism. But now, there's no leading edge, no hegemonic ism, no pictorial leap of faith. Are we short one Pablo? Everything is available now. All the conventions can be checked off, figurative, abstract. Conceptual, installation, appropriation, desecration, new materials, hideous materials, rupture, photography, time lapse, storyboard, headlines, pixelation, eros, beauty, text, anonymity, chart, chat, pattern, banality, system, Fetish, science project, narrative, 
etc., etc. <laughs> What's left to be said then? Oldest question in the book. What pulchritudinous, what pulchritudinous audacity will keep the adventure going? And what daring formal constraint will drain the question of all meaning? There were a lot of paragraphs in there, but you don't get to see them. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Second chance. Yes, the kids were small, there was a job, a wife, a lawn, and no doubt the dog needed to walk, the cat a can. Couldn't drop everything and drive across the bay to San Francisco's Keystone Corner on a whim after hearing the news that long, tall Dexter Gordon was in town. In retrospect, though, why didn't you? Tonight at 3 a.m., when you flicked on the radio, tuning in jazz after hours, you heard what you missed that night 35 years ago. Within four notes, you knew the breathy virility of tone belonged to Dexter's incomparable tenor. Slowly, caressingly, probingly, in no hurry to feel his way through, Dexter's shapely sentences answered the pianist's chordal feeds with architectural wit, each player picking his way through the changes of more than you know with veteran ease. When it was over, your hands should have been among those recorded clapping that night in the late 70s, but they had to wait till now. <clears throat> Another one called Lower Case. To peel, to peel a tangerine in a dark house before sunrise. To peel a clementine in a dark house before the stove heats the water in a kettle. Dear arbiter of the domestic, watch me hoof it down the driveway to fetch the morning rag, stopping halfway there to pull a few weeds. If only Shakespeare had left us a wheelbarrow. Still, I am here to endorse the apricot glow of dawn's thin streaks before they turn gray, quick to add a generous pinch of French tea to an outsized cup. You can't see me chew, spit seeds, read, drink, or think as it cools because I'm not in the picture. Cardinals whistle their song. Robins cock their heads, listening for worms. Doves coo in the forsythia. A grackle pecks at the last apple hanging, a bronzed remnant of last year's crop. I check to see who won, who lost, who died. Recycle paper, wash cup, press button, sit, scroll. Choose. What's up, Doc? Second nature. We're in touch. What a feeling. Godot's lady was a tramp, too. I give up. Only then does Jackie McLean answer my question, why was I born? Your skin. Smooth's not just an idea. Smooth's not just an idea lying somewhere between the creeping edge of a shadow and the rabbit fur kiss of fireflies in the Atlas Mountains. No, no, sweet patio. What will the unbroken business of the universe come to if it fills my porcelain brain with a demented glow each time we touch? Imagine the creamy surface of marble veins brushed by trailing fingers while hiking a dry creek in Death Valley. Or Jean Arp's hand, which left us perfect records of its travels on the body. I get the feeling it was long ago, back before the leakies discovered hominid fossils in the Rift Valley, maybe a light year or two before Ovid, even, that something called peace was preparing the hollow of your lower back for the arrival of my hand. Charm, 
a way of getting the answer yes without ever asking a question. Or d'oeuvre, your skin served endlessly to a tickling spread of fingers. And the, the last one in the book, and the last of these little ones I'll read, is called Up on Cripple Creek. <clears throat> I know what Philip Roth was facing when he told the reporter that his new job was learning how to make his smartphone act smart. I tried to get smart myself to little effect when I chose to invent the 438 quotations that make up my confessions of an ignorant amalgamist. Gertrude Stein was not a perfect gentleman either, though. But what's it all about when you sort it out, Alfie? The joy we share as we tarry there? Gandhi read as he led. King dreamed as he preached. Lenin screamed as he sang and Ishmael alone survived to tell Herman's tale. When the straight road jogs, so do the bikes and helmets. I round the bend on the arc of America's bodacious curves, complete with shopping basket. But what's so vain about earthly pleasure? Is there any other kind? Since I stopped publishing the figures in 2005, <clears throat> I couldn't stop making books, and I decided just to make a lot of books of my own writing. It uh, kept me making books and finishing work and collaborating with various artists. Um, and I thought maybe I'd read a... I need a copy of Dumbstruck. Painter who gave all the beautiful paintings for this book is here, Daniel Heidkamp, and uh, terrific painter, and uh, he provided beautiful works for this. And these are all my phony sonnets. They all are 14 lines long, and that's about as much uh, sonnet as uh, I could claim for them. <clears throat> Get graphic. Miami is calling, but I'm not picking up. Got a kitten purring on my lap and a job to do carving the pumice of morning. They say the great ones grab time by the scruff of the neck and pin it to the mat with a growl. Then what? Can you make time do your bidding? Slippery as water, spatial as forever, time taunts the attentive. Only one thing for sure stops it, but let's not get graphic. <clears throat> oh, the last poem in the book is called Surfy, S-U-R-F-Y, Surfy. <clears throat> is it possible to think of death as just another chore we all must do? <laughs> like taking out the trash or doing a load of laundry? <clears throat> What will you miss when you're gone? The tragic, com the tragic comedy of disbelief? Lemon juice squeezed into the seed cup of, of an avocado? What, who goes there down at the end of the driveway? You start, you stop, you sleep like a cat all day until time runs out the front door. When the last wave breaks, no, the last wave never breaks. This is a poem for all the painters in the house, of which there are many. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very short poem it's called Tedium. And uh, Warren Eisensee read this and he called it Tedium. Uh, 
um, which was kind of funny, uh, since he knows what it's like to be alone in a studio. <clears throat> to Diem, how non-global, how old school, and how isolated is the image of the painter alone in a studio painting a picture with paint. Many of these are little poems in this book called Rimrock are just one sentence broken up to look like poetry. <laughs> Mexican Tibet. Dreamt I donned someone's Yankee hat and that it was fitted with featherweight headphones. And as I walked through Guanajuato's winding colonial streets, I was surprised to be listening to Bartok's second string quartet, especially when I realized the hat belonged to Richard Gere. <laughs> you remember him, come on. Um, this is called A Pancake You'll Flip Over. <clears throat> Sorry. I am vulnerable to those kinds of titles, though. And, um, <laughs> facts, facts of life and death remain the same. We live and die. We love and grieve. We breed and disappear. And between these existential gravities, we fall for meaning, build on memory, leave a record for those who will forget us. Maybe. P.S. Oh, I can't read this. This is too, this is too painful. No, let's, 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 let's endure this. P.S. As artists, you get to be selfish in compensation for the likelihood of your failure at an enterprise in which you stake everything. But if you think you're happy, you are. Now we're gonna take a little trip to India. Uh, less than two years ago, I spent three weeks in India. Uh, my younger son got married there. It was a destination wedding to Goa, and we all had an incredibly great time. They put together these sequence of nights and days and activities and parties and dances and, and costumings, and, and then uh, the crazed irony of is that, that 36 hours after the wedding, it was over. They broke up. Uh, and it was, the, the, it, was, it was really the best thing that could have happened. Um, <clears throat> And he seems relatively unscarred by it all because there was enough doubt going on going into it. Uh, but we who went remember the parties. <clears throat> and it got me to India and, uh, all, and I, I spent a week in Varanasi, the holy city of Varanasi. It used to be called Benares, now it's Varanasi. The Ganges goes through beautifully uh, wide and gray and, and uh, the, the city's interesting for many, many reasons, but it's only built on one side of the river. The other side, just mud flats going on forever. And um, so this is the one poem that I wrote in the little town of Udaipur, and then the rest were written in that week uh, in Varanasi. 17 November 2011. <clears throat> See me here, if you will, busy reader, at 4.15 in the Apre Midi on a rooftop in Udaipur, the Mayur Cafe, to be exact, just opposite the 30 steps you will climb to enter the Jagdish Temple, and but a few scant yards from a warren of streets crammed with anonymous artisans in minuscule shops working with gold, brass, fabric, and brush because I'm sipping from a pot of black tea, about to take a long look through glassless window frames painted yellow at the city's jumbled neighborhoods stretching out to where distant dry hills meet the blue of the Rajasthan sky. On a day like this, I think I can see Miami.
almost gone. Great to be tossed in the flotsam of India, where the god of prosperity is an elephant. And not to worry if the streets are caked with his dung, as well as the dung of cows, goats, dogs, water buffalo, monkeys, boars, and humans. Because each morning, it's almost gone, distributed equitably by car tire, shovel, and the vicissitudes of fate. Now I walk the street in the cooler air of morning, marveling at motorized rickshaws packed with clumps of kids being rushed to schools, the smooth rev of motorbike and motorcycle rhyming with the conversational honking of horns, about to pass you, happy to praise the brightly clad women bent over, sweeping with single-hand brooms the dust, trash, and caca into neat piles to be left by the side of each small business or home. Let it be. Get me out of this shit holy land. <laughs> I feel I'm back in some biblical pageant 2,000 years before the advent of Club Med. <laughs> I can't avoid being reminded that green salads are good for us as I spoon up another dollop of rice and dal. The naked child in her sister's dirty arms will break your heart for a few rupees as kid goats nose their mother's dried up teats desperate for a taste. If only Hamlet had said, foraging is all. Depressing one minute, hopeless the next, it takes a concept like Maya to let it be. Seeker gene. Seeker gene. While my seeker gene is missing in action, as if surgically removed a few lifetimes ago, when a hole is filled, where does it go? India's bearded old buggers with kind eyes walk timeless roads wrapped in saffron-colored cloth, one hand on walking sticks wrapped the same color, only to sit by day on a gat in sunlight and meditate or snooze or just watch Ganga flow and the beetle-teethed boatmen row as if they have nothing better to do than seek enlightenment in this single-syllable skit of a holy city. It was tough being sick a lot of the time when you're in Italy, because your body inevitably takes a hit from the food, and you're taking Imodium, and you're trying to hang together and keep a stiff upper lip, as they say, but uh, it's, it's tough. There's one called the, the, the weakest part. <clears throat> At Asi Gat, I heard the sound of a harmonium together with a voice singing and for a minute thought it was Allen Ginsberg and wondered if it was in India that Allen first got the notion to chant poems and sing Blake's songs accompanying himself on harmonium because by the mid-70s the instrument was part of his act, albeit the weakest part. Things to do on, in, and around the Ganges. Ask your oarsman to row you across to the empty mud flats. Brush your teeth. Wash your shirts, pants, sheets, and tablecloths by whacking them repeatedly on stone. Light a candle inside a coconut shell garlanded with marigolds and let it float away. Put your hand in the water to see how warm it is. Bargain for a brass bell with floating merchants who attach their boat to yours like benign pirates presenting an array of goods. Be struck by the chanting of white-robed Asians wearing respiratory masks as they float downstream to Manikarnika Ghat. Sift a bucket of ashes 
for fragments of gold. Watch Indians soap up, then dip their bodies three times in the water to rinse, sometimes clapping their hands overhead, a ritual at one with the mother. Wonder why bathers don't swim out more than a few anxious strokes. Note the caste system's pecking order, which dictates who gets cremated closest to the water's edge. And uh, for this reading, um, about two weeks ago, um, Elaine Equi, poet with whom I read last night over in Brooklyn, uh, said, gee, Jeff, if you're coming to town, will you bring some of your recent drawings? And I had a bunch of recent drawings, and I had some recent poems, and so I whipped out this little book called All the Anarchy I Want, 15 poems and about 15 drawings. <clears throat> Smooch. To be eye level with a reader is what I want. To be eye level with a reader is what I want. I don't look down at my guy. And I don't want anybody looking up at me either. I was a draft dodger. Big deal. Not the last man standing in some foreign shitstorm 50 years ago. But what is poetry all about? Who's willing to die holding on to the soul of the syllables? Will you follow the poem no matter where it goes? No matter who's standing in the way? Who's dragging you down? Who doesn't get it and can't hack it? When you get to the finish line, if you've got five people still with you, you should kiss their fucking feet. Um, Charles Bernstein wrote a book of criticism recently called uh, Attack of the Difficult Poems. And I wrote uh, uh, a poem, including something, it's called The Hangover Scene from Attack of the Difficult Poems. Charles was alive again. Consciousness was upon him before he could get out of the way. Not for him the slow, gracious wanderings from the halls of sleep. No, he experienced a summary, forcible ejection. Sprawled and scattered like a shattered trilobite on the tarry shingle of the morning, the light did him harm but not as much harm as looking at Susan did. He resolved never to move his eyeballs again. A dusty thudding in his head made the scene before him play chopsticks. His mouth had been used as a latrine by some small creature in the night and then as its mausoleum. During the night, too, He'd somehow been on a cross-country run and then been expertly thrashed by a trio of biker chicks. To say he felt equal to death, do we have to? Do we have to? That was, uh, I have to uh, acknowledge that there's a, a famous paragraph source from Kingsley Amos about a hangover that I adapted. Um, this is one called Bankrupt Recitals. Like any born-again surfer with a Whitmanic chip on his shoulder, I resist the privileged peccadilloes of the aristocracy as presented in Downton Abbey. Not that I'm not wholly devoted to moral equivocation, knee-jerk snobbery, and formal dress wear for what it tells us about tradition's bankrupt recitals. But I notice I really only perk up like a corner kick from the third world, when they show the family down on its luck, forced to make calculated plays at suckers with money in order to keep their elegant game going. Will they find a soul richer and stupider than themselves? These wan generations of spoiled gentry take a portion of their humorless moxie from the proud fact that they keep half the town on their payroll. But I'm not one. Pop culture, you gotta, you gotta, you know, use it. Um,
blonde. I hate to introduce the concept of documentation to what is ordinarily a private thing shared between intimates. But I bet you'd love to see how gorgeously arrayed your hair was last night on the pillow with my hands weaving through it, even as you were happily and seriously occupied doing something miraculous to a part of me that kept slipping from view. Pushpins of oof. Behind crazy belief lie even crazier delusions that dead people rise from the grave, that humans are born of virgins, that hallucinations called angels and daemons whisper eternal truth into the ears of prophets sitting in caves that in this immense universe, some invisible off-planet nobodaddy has chosen this fly speck of an earth to torment with divine love while numbering the hairs on your head. Believe these things? You'll believe anything. We're fair game for predatory bankers with their easy loans, for lawyers who tell us the laws about justice. It's about power for the Poles who insist the enemy is over there, that we must kill him before he comes over here. We're targets for technocrats who work for the rich, turning life into a numbers racket. With terse smiles, they tell us that whatever we need, we can't have yet and don't deserve because they're not done maximizing profits. Um, this is a, a title, Jacaranda Over Green, that I wish Rothko had painted. A jacaranda, if you know the tree of flowers in the spring in California, beautiful lavender colors. Maybe not just California, maybe other western states. I don't think we have any in the east. Uh, and so jacaranda over green. To set this utterance straight is to know that joy is art's essence, grief its main story, baloney its main taste. I hang on because I'd fall if I didn't. Mondrian straightened the curved branches of a tree. It wouldn't be art if he'd had permission. Never shy away from one human, one vote. She may have put the knock on my worst, but the movement here is Benjamin Constant. The day grows dark with the effort to paint dollar signs where my ears should be. I don't date my works, he remembers saying to Clytemnestra in 453 BC. I hardly feel I write them. And I think, I think I'll finish with that. Um, poem that uh, Vincent uh, quoted a little bit of. Uh, we were just in India, now we'll go to Rome. And um, uh, I've read this once or twice before. I know Debbie and Agee have heard it. But um, some places you go, they're not good for you. And you don't know until you go once or twice that you shouldn't be there. <laughs> and I had to learn that about Rome. Um, why Rome? I mean you know, perfectly great place to get a cup of coffee or something, but I, um, or see it art beyond belief. So I had to uh, <clears throat> wave goodbye to Rome. Uh, <clears throat> if you know Rome, I'm sure you'll be, have a chance to revisit some of your favorite spots here. <clears throat> How can, waving goodbye to Rome. How can I go back now I've said goodbye, taken my last look at the Piazza Navona, tasted my last tartufo from Trescalini near the fountain, walked for the last time around the Campo di Fiore looking up at Bruno. No more narrow curved streets sick with motor scooters and cars, no more standing in front of the Palazzo Farnese at night with spotlights on the facade, the cafes filled, the couples ambling. 
No more hot strolls along the Imperial Forum Road past the Colosseum to visit Michelangelo's Moses. No more Bernini interiors or gardens with pepper trees. I'm not going back. I'm savoring this long goodbye. Wondering why Rome puts a hex on my life. Why misery lands on me the minute the plane lands. Why rooms seem too small, the noise too loud, the emotions unchecked. I'll just remember the Campari and soda at the cafe on the Via Condotti and the crowds at the Spanish steps with dolphins leaping because in this town I wear slave garb. I can't go back to tea and croissant at the Rosano bar plotting Keats and the day. There's too much scaffolding on my inner life, too much dirty language buried in the heart. Tour buses disgorge lovers of weeds and ruins so that all of you fallen columns, wherever you lay, must languish on your sides and temples. Go ahead and let your polylingual guides trumpet your bogus virgin stories. Goodbye, ornate Pamphili corridors and lines so long you know the Vatican must be heaven. Black alley cats and aristocrats, everyone young and old, goodbye. Gurgling water and hanging laundry, goodbye. Goodbye, guy in a pack of scooters zooming by holding a cell to one ear and smoking with the other as somehow he guns it. Lording it over the streets, the great plinths are topped with horses and riders, but I'm never coming back. No more night bridge crossing the Tiber into Trastevere looking for a fresh fish meal. No more darkened corners, spotlit towers, or craft market earrings. No more walking lost in a light rain or breakfast figs. I've looked up at my last ceiling, down at my last floor. Rome stands me in a corner with my own quandariness. Trajan's column, a screw job. Argentina, a polluted tram stop. Dear reader, I am sorry. You go in my place. Let me wave goodbye and swear never to mention Rome again. Thank you.